So I'm gonna um, just ground us again in this slide that we've looked at a couple times now. Um, the anatomy, the, like emerging structure um, that a lot of these LLM powered applications have. Um, and so we talked about you know, the, what the user sees, um, the language um, user interface that the user interacts with. Um, and when the user interacts with a system like a, an LLM powered application behind the scenes, um, usually that application consists of a few pieces. There's the underlying model, like you might expect from OpenAI or Anthropic or wherever you get, wherever you purchase your models today. Um, then there's the instructions, which is the prompt, um, all the fun prompt engineering magic that goes into that, um, or the chains, the, the, um, the more logical sequence of prompts that um, you can use to tell the model what to do. And then more often than not these days, those instructions also interact with external information that you can't fit directly into the instructions. Um, and that's via tools, it's via retrieval systems, um, vector databases, or more generally functions. Um, so that's kind of the, the structure of the LLM app, um, and that's what we've covered so far. Um, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is um, let's, let's talk a little bit more practically about how you get from the prototype of all these systems working together to something that works really well in production. Um, and what we're gonna cover is the, like what I think of as like the improvement system for the LLM application. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about some of the pieces of that now. Oops, struggling here. Um, so we're gonna talk about a process for building and iterating on language model powered applications um, that you can think of as being like analogous to test driven development. Um, but to start off with, we're gonna cover how, how do you actually choose which model you wanna work with? Um, there's so many models available today, closed source, open source, um, and everything in between. Um, how do you pick which one you're actually gonna use? So TLDR, um, and this is kind of my opinionated take, but what I encourage people to do is, um, well, like first of all, just understand that there's no best machine learning model. There's no best LLM. The best model um, depends on your use case, and in particular, the trade-offs in your use case between um, things like the quality that you're able to get out of the box for your task, the speed, like the latency with which you're able to produce results, which has a big impact on the user experience, um, cost, obviously, um, and then how like hackable or extensible the model is. Um, because you know, if, if, even if you can't get good out-of-the-box performance, the more customizable, um, the more you're able to actually squeeze more performance if you're willing to put enough effort in. And then um, uh, lastly, like data security and license permissibility. Um, but I think the short answer is like, I almost inc always encourage people to use GPT-4 to start. Um, and there's a pretty simple answer for why, um, which is that, like I think um, generally, you know, for AI applications, in general, and LLM applications in particular, the first thing that you need to do is you need to um, basically prove whether the ta prove to yourself whether this task is feasible, um, and prove to your organization whether anyone actually cares if you solve it. Um, so if you if you are um, if you're working on a new task, then most of the time I wouldn't really think about cost upfront. Um, I would start by making sure that we can do this task with no constraints, and that if we do it, people will care. Um, the easiest way to do that is with the most powerful models that you have available to you, which is, for almost every use case, is GPT-4. Um, there's some exceptions to this, like if you're working on an environment where you know this needs to run an embedded device or, um, or something like that where, yeah, it's probably not, like the feasibility question is not something you'll be able to answer by using GPT-4, but in most cases, I think you start with GPT-4, make it work, and then you make it cheaper or make it faster. Um, so one question you might ask, or one question I get a lot is like, do you want to use a proprietary model or do you want to start with open source? Um, so the short answer is proprietary models are better. Um, they are higher quality today um, and they're much, much easier to use and interact with. Um, serving, like hosting open source models introduces infrastructure overhead. It's a huge pain. Um, there's good tools available for it now, but they're not that good. It's still gonna create a lot of effort for you and your team. Um, and so I, uh, and it's also gonna be more expensive. Um, not in the limit, in the limit, open source is cheaper, like if you're willing to invest a lot on in the infrastructure side, but for you, when you're starting out, um, it's gonna be cheaper for you to pay OpenAI to run your models, or pay Anthropic to run your models than it will be to run your own open source models. 
And that's because they have cheaper access to GPUs and they have invested a ton in like making serving and training really efficient. Um, so propri proprietary models are better. Um, and so you should use those. Um, unless you really need open source. So why might you need open source? Um, I think the main reason, like the reason people don't really talk about, but I think in my mind, like the most important reason is that open source models are much easier to customize. So if you're doing something, like if you want the maximum flexibility to experiment and to try things and to push the envelope a little bit of what these models are capable of, then um, that's a good reason to use open source. Um, another reason that people kind of cite for using open source is to like, like own the whole stack myself or to like respect data security. Um, I think that's, in some cases, it's a decent argument, but I think it's like a very, very overrated argument, honestly. Um, I think um, most of these like LLM providers um, have, you can sign contracts with them where they won't touch your data. They won't train on your data. Um, they have pretty good security practices. Um, if you're worried about OpenAI security practices, you can you know, deploy a mo your model in your own Azure environment or on AWS with Anthropic or something like that. Um, so I think like owning the stack or like data security in my mind are not really like, it's an argument I hear all the time for using open source, but I think it's a pretty weak one. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and like the way I would think about this is, yes, you wanna own the IP of your AI powered products yourself, but um, owning the IP, like to me, it's like um, arguing that you need to use open source um, because you wanna own the stack is like saying, oh, we want, we're gonna build our own, we're gonna build our own um, data warehouses because we wanna own all the infrastructure ourselves. It like just doesn't make sense if a company invests in like sinking all this money into building something better to um, go try to replicate that yourself. Um, unless that's really where, unless that's really where you're gonna accrue value um, as a company. In most cases, the value that you're gonna accrue is much more to do with the application that you build around the model and the data set that you build around the model than the core model infrastructure itself. Um, other good reason to use open source, by the way, is that in the limit, it is cheaper. And so if you're very cost sensitive, then um, you, and you are willing to invest a lot of upfront in driving costs down, then you can achieve a lower like per unit cost um, using open source. Um, one, I think one thing that's important to know in this, in this field of like uh, LLMs, which as boring as it seems, is open source licensing. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, w typically when we think of op open source, our mental model is like, oh, this is just free code I can use for anything I want to. And there are some models that operate that way um, under licenses like Apache 2, but you do have to be careful in the open source um, model world because there's also um, a lot of models that are released under restricted or non-commercial licenses where, you know, you can use them for research, um, but you, like, they actually either explicitly prohibit commercial use or there's kind of terms in the licenses that are ambiguous about whether you can um, use it for commercial use or not. So just a thing to pay attention to um, because in the open source LLM world, a lot of people wanna say they're open source even if they're doing something that is not actually open source. Um, so, you know, like one of the big uh, factors is for considering which LLM to use is the performance, like the task performance. And just like we discussed with um, embeddings and information retrieval, there's really only one way to know which LLM is gonna work best for your use case. And that is to try it on your use case, to measure the performance of that LLM on your use case. Um, you will find all kinds of like general benchmarks that people release about LLM performance. Um, and those can be helpful for building like an overall sense for which models are you know, overall better than others. But, um, just because one model is better on a benchmark than another model does not mean that it would be better on your task. And so task performance is the only thing that matters in the end. Um, so again, most projects should start with GPT-4. Um, this will give you proof of concept about feasibility. Um, metaphor is like, you know, in, if you're um, doing software engineering work, typically you prototype in, you, um, like the best practice would be to prototype in the highest level language that you can um, to reduce development time um, and avoid premature optimization. And then uh, for whatever things that end up becoming critical path for your code, um, things that are relatively mature, that are performance bottlenecks, then you might re-implement those in C or Rust or something like that. Um, I think of building with LLMs in a similar way, like you prototype with the highest level language possible, which is GPT-4, and then um, as your stack matures, you can start to replace parts of that GPT-4 stack with smaller, faster, cheaper models, whether they're open source or just smaller commercial models. If you run into problems with cost or latency, you can consider downsizing um, both GPT 3.5 and Claude 
um, are really good choices for this and are pretty comparable in performance. Um, and if you wanna go even faster and cheaper, like I don't really see a huge difference between those models, but it might be pretty task dependent. Um, I would say like of the, like the, of the tiny models, like the small options for the models, um, uh, Anthropics seems to be like the one that's trained in the most modern way. Um, and yes, open source is a viable option, but it is definitely a lot more work. And so if you're focused on building applications, I wouldn't start there. Um, and yeah, I would say the, the most, the best options today are uh, the seven billion parameter model from Mistral and the Llama 2 variants. But there's new um, open source models being released every week. And so this is probably gonna be a uh, out of date recommendation very soon, um, if not already in the week since I made this slide. Um, okay, so you have a, you have a, um, you have a model now. Um, now the question is like, how do you actually work on your prompts? Um, how do you improve your prompt over time in order to like achieve the best performance on your task? Um, so as you work on your prompts and as you work on your chains, how do you save your work? Like how do you um, keep, how do you um, keep track of progress over time? So why are we talking about this? Um, well, I, I think there's like an interesting analogy here to where we were with traditional deep learning, you know, the old school deep learning, uh, pre-LLM deep learning, back in 2015 when I got in the field. So what it felt like to work in deep learning at the time was I would train all these models and every single time I trained a model, I would write down the hyperparameters in a spreadsheet. Um, and I would do that because otherwise there's no way for me to remember what I had already tried and what I hadn't tried. And then when I trained the model, I would save that training file on, um, as like a, just a file on my laptop, so I would have it for later. Um, but there was no way for me to reproduce experiments or share my work with a team or anything like that. Just like, I would train the thing, and I would have a record of what happened, and that's only available for me, and that's basically it. Um, now, if you do traditional deep learning, if you're training models from scratch or fine-tuning models, um, you have access to amazing tools where every single time you run model.train, you automatically get a full log of that experiment. Um, contains all the hyperparameters so you don't have to write them down. It's shareable, it's comparable, and it's fully reprodu reproducible. Like you could run the exact same thing again and produce the same model. Um, today, I think prompt engineering um, feels a lot like traditional deep learning did in 2015. So um, every time I change my prompt, what I'll do is I'll play around with it in like the OpenAI playground or some other sort of model playground. Um, old prompts, like changes to prompts I made in the past are lost to time. You know, they're just, uh, they're buried somewhere in a spreadsheet or in, um, in your, your chat GPT logs. And there's no way to reproduce experiments, share work with team or anything like that. Um, and so I think the question is like, what is the equivalent of the tooling stack that we'll have for, that we have now for traditional deep learning? What is that going to evolve into for prompt engineering? Um, I think the answer is still, the, the jury's a little bit out there. So, um, you know, why was, it, why was this so impactful in deep learning? Like why, um, why did this like accelerate the, the uh, ability for people to build deep learning models so quickly. Um, the reason why was because in deep, the deep learning world, you constantly need to go and back and check old experiments. Um, so uh, the reason for that is because experiments take a long time to run. So when I was training models, you know, the models would take anywhere between a few hours and a few weeks to train. And so I, I was constantly needing to go back and look at models that, were, that I started training a long time ago. So it's really important to have a record of what I had done. Um, and also, I often ran many experiments in parallel. Like, I would run a hyperparameter sweep. Um, I would, you know, run, train on like uh, 256 GPUs at a time, because it's the nice thing about working at OpenAI, even back then, we had access to a lot of GPUs. Um, and so, you know, being able to, I, I couldn't keep track of all of that in my head. Um, and it's way too easy to end up repeating yourself or like getting lost in a loop without having track of uh, what you were doing before. But prompt engineering today doesn't really have the same dynamic. Um, so you might argue that prompt engineering like maybe isn't in need of the same level of uh, tooling around experimentation as deep learning was. And the reason for that is that, you know, in contrast to deep learning, experiments are quick. It feels more like writing code than it does like training a model, right? Like I, I can just add a line of text to my prompt and rerun it, um, and it's pretty much instant that I get the feedback back. It's not like I have to wait days or weeks to see the result. Um, I also usually do experimentation sequentially, and most people I know do experimentation sequentially. Um, like, you try one change to a prompt, you run it, you see if that has the desired effect. Um, if not, then you make another change, um, and you look at one result at a time, much like you would in like a REPL um, when you're writing code. And most of the time today for most people, this experimentation itself is pretty limited. 
like you are, um, I'm not, like in, in the deep learning world, you're trying all these hyperparameters, you're running these sweeps, trying 100 different variants of the same experiment. But in prompt engineering, you know, oftentimes the experimentation is limited by the ideas that you have about how to change the prompt or how to change the chain, um, rather than just like running a sweep over some hyperparameters. And so we often, we usually try many fewer things in prompt engineering today. Uh, so I would argue like you don't really need to pay as much attention to prompt management today as you do to, as you did to experiment management. Um, but I think there's something that's going to change this, which is that um, imagine that you had a way to just automatically evaluate like a change to a prompt, like is this change to a prompt better? Um, that would unlock our ability to um, search over prompts um, or run many changes to prompts in parallel and see what the results are, like kind of like what we were talking about in the, when we talked about um, the prospect of prompt engineering becoming automated. And so when that comes to pass, um, then I think we're gonna start experimenting a lot more with the prompts that we have. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's going to increase the need for specialized tooling around managing prompt engineering experiments. Today, um, I think there's kind of like three main ways that I see people doing this. So level one is like do nothing. Just, you know, make your prompts in the OpenAI playground, you know, copy and paste them into a text file, like the ones that work. Um, you know, share them in Slack with your team. Uh, save them directly in your code. And um, that is usually actually good enough, um, honestly, especially if you're building a prototype. Um, but this obviously hits a limit when you're building applications or when you're collaborating with people. You need a more, it, it, becomes valuable to have a more systematic way of managing these prompts. Level two, like what I see most people graduate to is just track prompts the way that you track the rest of your code. Um, just track them in your GitHub repo. And um, I actually think this is kind of what most people should be doing. Like just, um, you know, save your prompt as a text file in your GitHub repo or even save it as a string in your uh, like Python or JavaScript file um, and just version control it and uh, collaborate on it that way. Um, I do think like it's slightly better to save them as a text file than as a string in, uh, in you know, Python or JavaScript because um, I think it makes it easier to like, uh, share those with like, non-technical folks on your team. And then level three, which I think is like, becoming more common but still not very common, is to track prompts in a specialized tool for tracking prompts. Um, and I think if you want to be able to run many evaluations in parallel or if you want to be able to decouple prompt changes from deploys, like be able to change, have a non-technical member of your team change a prompt um, without redeploying all of your code, um, then this can become really useful. And so I do expect to see more people use these over time as, uh, as, as evaluation gets better and more consistently used. Um, okay, so what, you know, what should you look for in a specialized prompt tracking tool? Um, I think there isn't really like a standard that's emerged here yet. Um, you know, a lot of the like traditional experiment management tools from the traditional deep learning world have offerings for prompts now, weights and biases, Comet, MLflow. Um, there's startups that have specialized offerings around this. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, and, like the cloud providers are um, building stuff for this. So I'm not sure how mature it is. Microsoft has a tool called PromptFlow. Um, so there's no standard that's emerged for this. I would say like some things that I would look for if I was, if I was building a tool like this is um, I would want to be able to decouple prompts from Git. Like I'd want to be able to manage, like have a source of truth for prompts in Git but be able to have um, like test changes to prompts and have non-technical st stakeholders test changes to prompts without interacting through Git. Um, because I think one, in a lot of organizations that I talk to, um, one of the biggest pain points is that like, oftentimes the people who are best suited to write the prompts are not the software engineers, um, not the ML engineers either, right? It's like the people who care about the task. Um, and everyone's used ChatGPT at this point, right? Like writing, writing a prompt is not something that is uh, restricted to people who have technical training. Um, and so I think a really desirable property of a system like this would be to be able to involve non-technical stakeholders in a way that doesn't um, compromise the, the quality of the rest of your code. And so, you know, one piece of that is that, like, you should be able to, um, it should have a playground component to it, right? Like, the non-technical user should be able to interact with things in the UI. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, so these are some of the things I think would be, like, helpful properties to have in a system like this. And so, it's worth paying attention to this space um, to see like, if, you, if you need some of these things now um, to try out some of the tools, um, and if not, to just keep an eye and see if one emerges as a standard. So um, again, coming back to my recommendations here, I think you should manage your prompts and chains in Git, and it's, uh, it's worth checking out some of these other tools if collaboration um, or automated evaluation become a big pain point. All right, um, any, any questions so far? Um, 
the next topic is like one of the, the meteor ones, which is around testing and evaluation. All right. Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't have a specific recommendation for that um, yet, but there's, there's a bunch of tools that are trying to do this. Um, yeah, Le Langchain has one, um, and a lot of the tools in the space, like a lot of the startups in the space have offerings around this. Um, so you could, yeah, you could, you could try some of the ones out. I think they're all like relatively immature, but um, yeah. Cool, okay. Um, Next topic is testing, and I think like, I, I think I kind of realized this the last time we taught this class, but certainly since then have come to believe that this is like probably the single most important part of everything that we're gonna talk about today. Um, because I think a lot of the problems with LMs and prompt engineering today are that like, um, we're, we're trying to make, we're trying to, like machine learning does really well at um, optimizing measurements. Like if you, if you have a number and you wanna make that number go up or make that number go down, then like the whole field of machine learning has evolved over the past like n decades to be have all kinds of really good techniques for making number go up. Um, but if you don't have a number to go up, then machine learning is kind of useless. I think that's a little bit where we're at with a lot of these LLM applications is sort of a lack of measurement. So testing or evaluation is about how you measure whether a new prompt or a new model is better than the old one change that you make is, a, is an improvement or not. And so the reason why this matters is because you're never gonna get things right to start out with. You're just not. LLMs make tons of mistakes. Um, the better that they get, the fewer mistakes that they make, but in, they're always gonna make a lot because um, they never are going to understand exactly what you want specifically out of the box. And to make matters worse, just because the new prompt that you made or the new chain that you made looks better on the handful of examples that you have, like that you ran it on your laptop, does not mean that it's actually a better prompt or model in general. It's super, super common to see, like you improve on five examples, but you get worse on five other examples. Um, and so if people rely on your model, like if you, if you have users, um, then there, you, you, um, the relationship that you have with the users of your AI system is a relationship of trust, where um, users are trusting you to maintain, among other things, to maintain performance on the things that they care about. And I suspect that like, a lot of what's happening right now in the AI power tool world is like in early in the year when everyone was really hyped about these tools, a lot of these things got a ton of adoption and um, really crazy usage numbers off the bat. Um, but we're starting to see some of them tail off. And I think the reason why is because, you know, you interact with these things and they feel like magic, but then as you start to get a feel for what they can and can't do, um, the trust that you have in them starts, gradually starts to erode. Um, and as that trust erodes, then your users churn. Um, and so your job as an AI application developer is to build and maintain trust with your users and evaluations are a really critical way to do that. Um, so let's talk about how to do this for LLMs. And I think I wanna ground this a little bit in um, how, to, how we used to test machine learning models the, the old school way, you know, and like um, all back in the day in like 2021. Uh, so in the way that testing a machine learning model uh, in machine learning works in general is um, you start with a data set. So in, before LLMs, you would always have a data set because you'd use that data set to create your model. After LLMs, um, oftentimes you start with a prompt instead of a data set. But in old school machine learning, you'd have a training distribution and you would sample two data sets from that distribution. One is your training set and then the other is your validation or your evaluation set. You compute your metric, like you compute your accuracy on each of those data sets. And the difference between those two numbers would give you a measurement for how much you're overfitting to the training data. So if your evaluation accuracy, if your validation accuracy is much lower than your training accuracy, then that means that you, know, you don't have enough training data or you're overfitting to that training data. Then you would sample some additional data from production, like from the actual data set that you want to test the model on. Um, and that would form your test set. Um, and you would compute your accuracy on your test set. Um, the difference between the accuracy on your test set and your evaluation set tells you how much um, you're overfitting to your validation set or um, how much domain shift is hurting you. 
right? Like how much the difference between production and, uh, and training distributions are impacting your performance. And then finally, um, you'd continuously measure accuracy on your production data over time. And the difference between the test set accuracy, so the model, the accuracy on your test distribution when you initially train the model, and the accuracy on your test distribution um, today, um, that difference tells you how much your data has changed, like how much drift has affected your model performance. So that's how we used to think about testing models. Now, why doesn't this work for LLMs? Um, the first, first of all, you don't actually have access to the training distribution, right? Like, OpenAI is not telling you what's in their training data. Um, and even if you use an open source model, where uh, then most of the open source, many open source models don't have open data sets. Um, even if they have open models and open data sets, like, let's be honest, you don't really know what's in the pile data set. Like, there's so much data there, just even understanding what's in that data set is a massive effort into it, on, to itself. So you don't have access to the training set, so it's, um, so it's like really hard to do, to do any sort of measurement on the training set. Um, then the other diff big difference is that like in the traditional ML world, we worked really, really hard to make sure that our training data and our production data were similar. Um, because, you know, machine learning only really gives you guarantees when you're, when you're running their model on data that looks like the data it was trained on. But in the modern like world of LLMs, your production data is always different than your training data, no matter what. Right, like you're never, um, because you don't really have control over your training data set and you're always trying it on some new task. So this paradigm doesn't really make that much sense anymore. Um, another big difference is that, um, which is not always true for LLMs, but it's often true for LLMs, is just the generative paradigm. So in traditional machine learning, you are doing most of the time things that look like classification. Um, so you have a set of predictions that you're making, um, and then there's a, a, a real answer to the problem that you're trying to solve. Like you might predict the bunch of images of cats or dogs, and then there's a way to know objectively whether the image is a cat or a dog. And so you can objectively measure the difference uh, in the predictions that the model made and the real answer uh, to, to compute traditional machine learning metrics like accuracy. But in generative, your prediction might be something like, this is an image of a tabby cat. Um, and the label might say, this is a photograph of a cat. Right, so is this a good prediction or a bad prediction? That sort of depends, right? It like, depends on what you're going for with your task. It depends on you know, what, um, what you consider to be a good answer. Um, so what metric do you use? Like, how do you actually quantify the difference, like the, the, um, the accuracy of a model in this paradigm? It's another really hard challenge. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of times in generative AI, like, you are building systems that are pretty general, that are meant to work for a lot of different tasks. So if you have an accuracy of 90%, that's pretty good. Um, but then if you break down that accuracy among the different things that your users care about, and you find out that actually, we have a great accuracy, 95% accuracy for questions about startups, uh, but we only have a 17% accuracy for questions about physics. Is this a good model or a bad model? Well, it depends, right? Like if you're if you're really just designing the system to be good at answering questions about startups, you're probably pretty happy with this. But if you, if you know that your users need to know about physics as well, then you definitely wouldn't be happy with this model. Um, so it's hard to summarize this like, diverse set of inputs and tasks with a single number. Um, yeah, so to summarize, you know, these models are trained on the internet, so there's always drift. Um, but drift also doesn't really matter in this world. Um, it's qualitative, so it's hard to quantify success, and there's oftentimes a diversity of behaviors that you care about, and so, it's, so aggregate metrics don't tell the full story. Um, so how should you think about testing LLMs? Um, I think there's kind of like two core questions that you need to answer. Or the first question is, what data do you evaluate on? Um, and then the second question is, what metrics should you look at to do the evaluation? So the, the key thing for building a data set is that this needs to be a data set that is specific to your task. So a good evaluation data set is um, like just really, really closely coupled with a good definition of the task to begin with. Like if you have a perfect evaluation set, um, that's in some ways you can think of that as like a perfect description of the behavior that you want the system to have. And so how do you actually do that? It sounds really hard. The good news is you don't have to do it all at once. Like you don't have to build a perfect evaluation set out of the box. Um, what you can do is you can start incrementally. You can pull in your language model to help you build this more quickly. Um, and then you can add data incrementally as you roll out to a larger and larger set of users. Um, and lastly, I think there's, there's hope that there might be a way to do this more in a more automated way in the future. 
So we start incrementally. So like if I'm writing a prompt, um, and let's say I want to write a prompt that helps me write short stories. Um, usually what I'll, the way I'll start out is like I'll start out by just typing what I want into ChatGPT and just playing around and seeing if I can get ChatGPT to do the kind of thing that I want um, in general. And then once I find something that seems reasonable, I'll usually move um, from that to starting to have a templated prompt where um, now rather than just asking it for a short story about uh, dogs and then LinkedIn, um, instead I'll have um, the ability to just pass in a different subject that prompts by filling in the template. And, uh, and then what I'll do is I will um, evaluate ad hoc. So I'll just try out these different subjects, one after another. Um, and then the way I start to systematize that is as you find interesting e evaluation examples, then you can just collect those evaluation examples and organize them into a small data set. Um, so then once I have that small data set of interesting examples, rather than just trying out things ad hoc, um, instead, when I make a change to the prompt, I'll run that new prompt on all of those interesting examples that I've flagged in the past. What are interesting examples? Um, struggling here, but I'm assuming that you can see that. Um, uh, there's like two things that make examples interesting. Um, one is examples are interesting that are difficult for the model to do. So if you're playing around with your model ad hoc and you find like a place where it fails, that's the thing that's worth saving because you'd wanna make sure that like, um, any changes that you make to the model in the future or the prompt in the future will um, perform well in that hard example. And then other interesting examples are just ones that are really different, right? So if you, you know, if you're, if you're like find yourself writing a lot of short stories about dogs and cats and things like that, and then all of a sudden you have this idea pop into your head that maybe users want stories about LinkedIn, that's really different. And so you might wanna record that one um, because the model might perform very differently for those types of stories. So hard examples and different examples are interesting. In order to do this faster, you can use your LLM to help. Um, so LLMs are pretty good at generating data. Um, it, they're not very good at generating like super diverse data, but they're pretty good at like just generating a bunch of examples faster than you might. And uh, so you can write a prompt like the one below to help you generate test cases. And this can be helpful for just bootstrapping, having like multiple things to try out your prompt on. Then um, as, you, as you go, you want to start to like expand this data set and try to make it more and more representative of the tasks that you care about. Um, in lockstep with how you roll the model out to, uh, to your user base. So um, you can use signals like what do your users dislike, um, what do your annotators dislike, um, even what does another model dislike, as well as things like um, what are outliers you know, relative to your current evaluation set um, or topics that you hadn't considered and things like that. And so you can do this like as you increase your user base. Like if you have, um, you know, if, you, if you're just working on this yourself and then next you roll it out to a couple of your friends or a couple of your coworkers, then you'll wanna look at the, the way that they're interacting with it and collect back any examples that you didn't think of um, that are hard or, inter or um, different from what you're currently testing on and incorporate those into your test case. And then as you roll out to your like alpha users, you'll do the same thing except at more scale. And then as you roll out to the broader user base, you'll continue to do that, but again, you know, with, with much more data to consider. Um, and so, you know, what, like, you might be wondering as you look at this is like, okay, is there a way to, like, we have this, these high-level ideas of, like, gathering hard data and gathering interesting data to fold into your evaluation set. Um, is there a way we could do this more automatically? Um, there isn't really today, but I think that there is a uh, more, I think that there's a possibility that there's a more quantitative way to um, evaluate the quality of an evaluation set. Um, so the intuition here is, like, um, imagine that you have like production data that's represented by this sort of blue space, um, this blue like data distribution, and then you have test data, like your current evaluation data points that are represented by the kind of dark blue points. Um, and so like test coverage for machine learning models, um, an intuition that you, can, that you could have is like um, a high test coverage uh, evaluation set is one where every data point in production is pretty close, is pretty similar to some data point in your evaluation data set. Um, and so, in contrast, a low test coverage evaluation set is one where there's a lot of data points in production that don't look anything like any of your evaluation data points. Um, so you can imagine formalizing this by trying to find um, the data points that are most different from your evaluation data and then incorporating those automatically into your evaluation use cases. Um, Slide issue again here. Well, okay, if I remember correctly what the slide says, um, 
the, uh, the question is like, is this enough? Like if you just found, you just look for the, the examples in production that are most different from your evaluation data and incorporated those automatically, what would you miss? The main thing that you'd miss is like a notion of the difficulty, right? Like you, um, there's a lot of data that your model is just gonna automatically do really well on. You don't necessarily need as much of that data um, to evaluate your model on. But on the other hand, if there's a bunch of data points that are really similar, but your model struggles with all of them, uh, you might wanna collect more data like that. So just an idea that I think is like um, one of the ways that this is gonna become more systematized over time. So the next thing that's hard, um, if you remember, is like, even if we have a good data set to evaluate on, how do we quantify performance? Um, so the, uh, like I think of this as kind of a decision tree. So if there's a right and wrong answer to the task that you're trying to do, then you're doing something like classification or regression. You're not doing generative. And so you can just use the normal evaluation metrics that you would use in the regular ML world, and your life is a lot easier. If there is no correct answer, but you have an example, or you have a handful of examples of good answers, then you can use metrics um, that match those reference answers to the answer that the model generated. Um, and ask the question of like, okay, is this, how close is this to the reference answer? So if you don't have um, a correct answer, it's a really good idea to try to have some, at least a subset of your examples where you have a reference answer, like something that you want to compare it to. But if you don't have that, um, you can compare it to previous answers, and you can try to assess which answer is better. Or you can compare it to human feedback, um, and say like, does this answer incorporate the feedback that a person gave? Um, or you can just look at static metrics, like you can just say, is this answer good or not? Um, and the key thing here is that like all of, with the exception of the first branch of this tree here, um, everything else, um, these are all metrics that are defined by having an LLM look at the outputs of the other LLM and assess whether those outputs are good or not. So in a reference matching metric, you have an LLM look at uh, the, the output that your model generated as well as the reference answer, and you write a prompt that says something to the effect of like, does this output you know, contain all the same information as the reference answer, or um, is it meaningfully the same thing as the reference answer, or is it saying something different? Um, if you're asking which is better, then the way that you'd write a metric for that is you'd uh, write a prompt that takes as an input um, both of the two answers and says like, which one's better? Which one's more accurate? Which one's funnier? Whatever way that you want those things to be better, et cetera. Um, and so the key idea here is using LLMs to evaluate other LLMs. Sorry, I'm like, I can't see what's on my slides, which is, makes it hard to, it's like, it, it is showing up there, right? Um, hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry for the lack of uh, presentation mode here. Um, so, I think like what a lot of people will say when they hear of this idea of like using LLMs to assess the quality of other LLMs is like, wait a minute, that seems kind of sketchy, right? Because it's like, well, if we don't trust the LLMs well enough to um, just trust their answers, then why would we trust them to check another LLM's answers? Isn't that kind of circular? And um, I think that's true, but um, two things to keep in mind. One is empirically it kind of works well, like you can, um, LLMs are better at assessing other LLMs than most people are, uh, most people that you'd pay to do it. Um, and the second is that like, just because you have an automated evaluation set up, like, just because you have LLMs checking other LLMs doesn't mean that you shouldn't also have people doing it. Um, and so the mental model I have for the right way to do this is like, you should think of your LLM, your automated evaluation as kind of like the fast eval process. Um, that is verified by a slow eval process, which is having humans do QA review. And so think about it as like different processes. If you're a developer and you're working on prompts and you wanna like try to find a better prompt or you're trying to fix a particular issue with the model, then you run the fast automated evals um, because it doesn't make sense for you to pay people to read the outputs or for you to read 100 outputs yourself or 1,000 outputs yourself every single time you add a word to your prompt. Um, so you should run the fast evals and just see 
whether, um, you know, first pass, whether the prompt looks like it's better or not. But then if you're deploying to production, if you're gonna put this in front of your users, then you should have a QA process, a governance process in place that involves people looking at those answers, um, which can tell you like, hey, are we, um, how much do we trust the automated evaluation and, uh, and, uh, and give you a better sense of whether this is, you should be comfortable putting this in front of your users. Okay, so that's kind of a quick overview on testing and evaluation. I'm curious if there's any questions on that. Yes. Um, it's, it's one of the hardest and I think the most important pieces of this whole puzzle. Because I think it's like, okay, imagine if you could do this really well. If you just had a reliable way of saying like, prompt A is better than prompt B, then I think a lot of the like nonsense around prompt engineering will just go away. Um, because then we can optimize it. And uh, I think also, you know, even looking at beyond kind of the engineering context of like how uncomfortable and hacky it is, it feels to do prompt engineering. I think a lot of what's slowing down LLM adoption in um, enterprises where I think it's gonna make maybe the biggest difference is just like, it's really hard to trust this thing in front of your users. And so if we had a way to, quanti to quantify um, that like, we know what the bounds of performance of this model are, then it's a lot easier to make those kinds of organizational decisions. Yeah, I just a quick question on the scope. When you say prompt, you mean all of the last hour of what we've been talking about, not just, not just to, uh, you Yeah, know, not, not just the prompt. prompt. I, I think what I mean is like the, um, the whole, um, the whole like LLM application. Yeah. So, so the, the before, I mean, I guess the, from the rag changing the prompt onward is what you mean. Yeah. And the chains, et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when you say, um, you, if you have a matching previous answer uh, and you want to compare the previous answer to the one that's generated, so how do you compare it with another LLM or is it more um, context? Or do you want to, are you referring to uh, comparisons? Yeah, I, I think like maybe to expand on this, um, you could, um, so the simplest thing you can do is you can just write a prompt that says, how good is this answer effectively? Like, rate this answer on a scale of one to five. It's like the simplest possible way you can do this. Um, the issue with that is that like, the LLM doesn't know what a good answer or a bad answer is necessarily. Like, cause it doesn't know what you care about in your task. Um, so a lot of what people end up doing or a lot of what makes these effective is the same thing that makes prompting effective. Like you, you need to make your evaluation prompt more specific to the thing, things that you really care about. Um, and one way to do that, like one hack to do that um, more easily is to give the model more information about what a good answer for this question looks like. So if you provide a reference answer, you still need to think about like what aspects of the reference answer you want it to keep. Because it's not, it doesn't need to be exactly the same as the reference answer. It could be worded differently. Um, and depending on your task, you might care about different aspects of it, right? So like um, maybe, you know, if the question is like, it's really important for it to get the facts right, like then maybe you, you'd, tell, you'd say the model, you'd tell the model like, hey, make sure that the, the answer here contains the exact same set of facts. Um, as the reference answer, but it's fine if it's worded in a different way. Or maybe what you really want, what you really care about about the reference answer is the tone. Like um, if it's a customer support, like make sure that the, the, the answer matches the tone of the reference answer. Um, and so no matter what you need to think about, like what aspects of the outputs do you, do you need to have in order to have good performance? Um, and then the reference answer can give you like additional information to point the model to to help it understand what you mean by that. So in the current state of art, uh, uh, do people automate this or people are manually intervening uh, to do such validations? So people um, who are doing this today are mostly uh, manually writing prompts to do, eva well, okay, so most people are not doing any automated evaluation. Most people are doing manual, pure manual evaluation. Um, some people are doing automated evaluation where they have models evaluate other models. Um, most of the people who do that are writing their own prompts to do it. Um, there's a growing subset of people who are like, uh, you know, um, 
using tools to do this. Um, like at Gantry, we're building tools to help companies evaluate performance of models, um, per, uh, performance of LLM applications. And so um, for certain use cases, like for retrieval augmented generation, we have evaluators that work extremely well out of the box, where you, you know, might not need to do too much of your own customization to, um, to like make a model that works well for this use case. Um, for other use cases um, that are like further away from things that are standard, people still need to kind of define for themselves what good performance looks like. For the manual evaluation, um, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to ask the model to provide the, its own reasoning uh, when asks a question, uh, when it answers a question, and also provides the quote with citation. Is it, um, how trustworthy is that information? For example, if you're just focusing, instead of looking at the answer, but that's the actual reasoning and like what quote, or what reference uh, it's referencing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, um, that's probably a pretty reasonable evaluation to make work pretty consistently. Um, because it, like evaluation is just prompting. It's, you know, it's kind of, it's, um, it's basically like, uh, uh, self, it's, it's like self-criticism, except it's applied after the fact. Um, so anything that you can do easily with a prompt, you can do easily with an evaluation. And things that are difficult to do with prompts are also difficult to do with, about, for, for, with evaluations. Hi, I had a question about uh, some terminology. When you say evaluation, um, I've heard people use it interchangeably with experimentation, and personally, I find it pretty confusing, and I try to sort it out, and I couldn't really get a straight answer just from doing some research of like sort of which term is uh, the best for whatever you're trying to describe. So I'm wondering, do you use it interchangeably, or do you think there's a distinction between the two when you think of evaluation versus experimentation? I think it's different. Um, I think um, evaluate, I use evaluation and testing pretty interchangeably. Um, and then experimentation to me means something different. Uh, if you're talking to someone in the machine learning world, experimentation means trying a bunch of different architectures and prompts and stuff and seeing which one works. And so experimentation relies on evaluation, but it's different. Like an evalu you can evaluate a single prompt, but experimentation means many. Um, and if you you're, if you're talking to someone in the product engineering world, experimentation means like uh, running a different variant in production on a subset of users and seeing which one the users uh, prefer. Okay, cool, makes sense. And I also yeah. have a, another sort of related question. Um, do you think it's useful at some point or at all to try to incorporate some notion of statistical significance when doing evaluations? Like if you're, let's say if you have 30 questions or 30 cases, right? And one variant gets 15 of them right and the other one gets 16 of them right? Like do you think it's useful to, yeah, basically make it a little bit more robust than just looking at the number and comparing the, the two numbers? Yeah, I do, but I don't see people do it very much um, for two reasons, one, like, I think mostly the phase that most people are at with these things are like still pretty early and so you're just trying a bunch of stuff. Um, and so, you know, if there's not a statistically significant improvement, then um, you might as well pick either one. Um, it's not like there's a high switching cost early on in a project. Um, and then the second reason is because it's expensive. So in order to incorporate statistical significance, I think for LLMs what you'd want to do is you'd want to incorporate the non-determinism of the LLMs you want to generate multiple outputs for each um, possible input. And uh, just most people aren't willing, like mo a lot of people have trouble justifying the cost of doing evaluation to begin with. Um, and so, you know, in order to run like the evaluation of, like 10 times effectively to get the meaningful stat sig numbers, just most people don't want to do that. All right, thank you. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about deployment. Um, actually, I'm gonna kind of gloss over this a little bit. Uh, so if you're using APIs, then this is not very hard. Like, you just call the APIs from your front end. Basically it. 
if there's a lot of other logic, like if you have complicated prompt construction, uh, complicated chains, things like that, then you might want to isolate the logic as a service in your backend, um, or potentially even multiple services. Um, deploying open source LLMs is a whole other thing. Like deploying open source LLMs is where this gets complicated and it's worth learning about if you go down this path. Um, but it's a bit beyond our scope for today. Uh, some references down at the bottom below if you want to learn more about this. And the other thing to know here is there's tons of frameworks that are emerging um, to do this uh, that make different trade-offs between ease of use, um, throughput, latency, uh, things like that. I would say that probably the two most credible are Ray and AnyScale and Mosaic. Um, Ray is what we use at Gantry. Um, a lot of people use Mosaic. Uh, Hugging Face and startups like Base10, a little bit more oriented around ease of use rather than performance, but also good options. And there's just a lot here to explore. So uh, check out the resources below. Do your own research if you want to, um, if you need to deploy open source LLMs. Um, next topic is, okay, now you've gotten this thing into production, how do you improve? Like, how do you make things better? Um, so, like, one way you can do this is through some of the techniques we talked about in prompting and chaining. Like, you can do self-critique. You can ask the LLM to assess its own answer. And if you have a high budget for cost and latency, you can do that before you return the answer to the user. Um, there are libraries, like, one, there's one called Guardrails AI, which is relatively popular, that help you do this in a more systematic way. Um, other things that you can do are, um, again, a lot of the techniques we talked about in the prompt engineering lecture, you can sample many times and choose the best option, um, different ensemble techniques. Um, and so all those techniques are relevant in production if you, can pay the, if you are willing to pay the cost and latency um, to do so. So once you've deployed, um, next thing that you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to tell, you need to measure whether this thing continues to work. So what signals should you be monitoring? Um, in addition to monitoring system performance metrics, if you're, especially if you're self-hosting, you're also going to want to monitor, monitor model performance metrics. Um, the most important one to measure is outcomes and end-user feedback. Uh, so if you have, you know, if you can tell how your users are using the output of this, then that's great. Um, even things like thumbs up, thumbs down feedback are useful. If you don't have outcomes or if you want like more detailed signal than just outcomes, then model performance metrics are also really relevant to measure. Um, so these can be these automatic LLM performance metrics, um, or they can be more traditional ML metrics if you can use those for your task. If you can't measure any of those things, then um, you, can, uh, you can look at things like proxy, you can look at proxy metrics, like um, you know, uh, did the result have the same subject as the question, things like that. Um, and then you can also measure the types of things that typically fail in production, um, which tend to be things like, uh, like you know, um, uh, the model refused to answer the question, or um, the model, like, uh, you know, said something offensive. Like, things that you, like common failure modes that you can write tests for. You can monitor those things as well. I think, like, one of the most important ones to get right if you're building a product around this is to gather feedback from users. Um, and so what is good feedback? Good feedback needs to be easy for your users to give you because users don't really care that much about how much you improve your LLM. Um, so it needs to be easy for them. Um, but it also needs to be high signal for you, right? So uh, the best kind of signal you can get from user feedback is if that signal is part of the user's workflow. So if the user um, has to do something with the output of your model in the, your product, where you can instrument that and see if they actually did the thing. Like, uh, did they copy this and paste it somewhere else? Um, or did they edit it before they did that? Like those types of signals. Um, the, uh, like one common pattern for this that I think is really powerful is the accept changes pattern. So like in Copilot, if you've ever used it, it'll make a suggestion for you. And then if you click, if you, you know, hit enter or whatever, it accepts that change. And so that's a really meaningful signal because that means it's useful for the user. The, the probably most common pattern is the thumbs up, thumbs down pattern. So it's just, you know, if you use ChatGPT or whatever, you can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down for the model's response. Um, I think, like, anecdotally, I've heard from most people that barely any users will do that. Um, it's a really, really sparse signal, and it's not very informative when you do get it because you don't really know why or um, whether the user is actually uh, representative of other people's preferences. So um, sometimes people will allow the option for users to provide longer form feedback once they have provided the low friction feedback. And that's sometimes useful for 
determining whether this is feedback you should incorporate or not. Um, we talked about this, this question of like measuring what actually goes wrong with LLMs. So in practice, I think the most common things that I see, honestly, the most common is UI stuff, which is kind of uh, uh, tough, to, tough pill to swallow as people who are developing AI applications. But um, I've heard from folks that have deployed like some of these LLM applications to massive number of users that people will click their thumbs down button and give them feedback. And the most common type of feedback they get is, hey, I don't really like the UI that you built for this thing, um, rather than the out model's outputs. Uh, and latency is like an especially important problem here. Like users hate it when things take a long time. Um, so you'll get feedback on that. Another really common one is incorrect answers or hallucinations. So if the model basically makes some stuff up, that's a really big issue with these systems today. Um, but it can also be long-winded answers. Like if, uh, often, you know, for some use cases, users want something that's really concise. Um, and models, uh, some models tend to ramble. So that's a common issue. Um, you know, the, the kind of negative side of reinforcement learning from human feedback is that, like the positive side is that it's helped models constrain their behaviors to things that are more acceptable for people. Uh, the negative side is that models, um, I'm sure you've all seen this, tend to dodge questions. Like, um, they'll say, uh, having a lot of laptop issues today. Um, they'll, they'll say like, I'm sorry, as a large language model trained by OpenAI, I cannot answer that question, even on things that are pretty innocuous. And so that, that tends to really rub users the wrong way. Um, but then there's other things that you might want to watch out for, like prompt injection attacks. Not very common, but maybe something that you care about not leaking your prompt to your users, um, or toxicity, profanity, things like that. So that's kind of like some of the signals that you might want to monitor for after you've deployed. Um, and then lastly, you know, once you've deployed, you're going to start to gather this data from your end users. And this data is invaluable because it tells you what are the tasks that your users actually want to do, not the ones just that you imagined that they were going to do. Um, and so this is the, the key point where you can start to like really improve the performance of your system by incorporating this data effectively. So how can you use user feedback? Um, you can use your user feedback to make the prompt better, or you can use it to fine tune the model. Um, using user feedback to make the prompt better is much faster and much easier, and is like most of what you should do. So the way you do this is you find themes in user feedback that are not addressed by the model. So if users are giving you a lot of thumbs down, um, or a lot of written feedback, you can look at, like, are there any patterns in where this feedback is coming? And you can just do this manually. Like, just look at these data points. Um, a lot of people I know who are building LLM applications will literally look at every single negative feedback they get every day, even if it's hundreds or thousands of examples. Um, and then they'll build mental patterns for where this thing is working and where it's not. Um, you could also imagine doing this in a more automated way with LLMs, though. Like, you could ask an LLM to tell you, what are the themes and feedback that I got? And then you can adjust the prompts to account for these themes. Like, if the model tends to fail in a particular way, you can do some prompt engineering. Um, you can add additional context to make the model better at answering those types of questions where you're seeing a lot of failures. This also feels like a place to me that you could probably automate. Um, if you trust your user feedback, uh, an LLM can probably do a pretty good job of um, understanding the themes in that feedback and then making changes to the prompt to adjust those themes. But um, the kind of like heavyweight option you have for improving your LLM is to fine tune it. Um, so there's a couple of different types of fine tuning that you might have heard of. The first is supervised fine tuning. And this is mostly useful if you want to adapt the model to a specific task. And it's just really not reliable enough through prompting or in context learning. And then like I think if you accumulate enough data, like if you have hundreds of thousands of data points of like input output pairs, then you can start to consider this as an option for things other than just, um, you know, like improving on something that's not working. The other like main reason I see people uh, doing fine tuning is to reduce cost. Uh, so if you have a relatively constrained task, even if GPT-4 can do it, it's probably not the cheapest way to do it. And so once you've collected enough examples, then you can start playing around with fine tuning as a, as a cost reduction mechanism. But generally speaking, like I think this is more of an optimization than it is uh, something that's core to building the application. Second type of fine tuning that you might see people do is uh, fine tuning from human feedback, which the most like kind of well known example of this is reinforcement learning from human feedback. And I would say this is like uncommon. Um, there's only a handful of companies that do this on their own. It's uh, much more complex and expensive to do than supervised fine tuning. Um, it just purely from a technical perspective, it's just a difficult thing to do. So the way that supervised fine tuning works is um, you uh, basically 
can um, update your, uh, like you can, you have different ways of um, basically fine tuning like some of the weights of your model um, or all of the weights of your model. So the simplest thing you could do is you could like update um, all of the, uh, like all of the layers of your model, you could just fine tune the whole thing. But what's more common to do is to um, keep most of the weights of your model frozen and only update like a small fraction of the weights uh, because it's cheaper to do and it's, um, it's faster and it can avoid overfitting. Um, one like kind of extreme place that this has gotten taken to is a tech set of techniques called parameter efficient fine tuning. Um, and so this is what, I, if you're gonna start fine tuning on your own, this is what I would look into to start. Um, the most like, I think probably best known technique in this category is called LoRa, uh, low rank approximation. And um, the, uh, the reason why this works so well is because um, you, again, like you're just, you're not updating all the 10 billion parameters that your model has. You're only updating a tiny, tiny fraction of them. And so it means you don't need as much data um, and you don't need to, like, um, you don't need as heavy weight of infrastructure to make it actually work. So quick intuition about how LoRa works. Um, you have your pre-trained weights, and remember your pre-trained weights are like the set of matrices that you're doing like a bunch of linear algebra um, billions and billions of times in order to like transform your input to your output. In LoRa, what you do is you, rather than updating every single one of the weights in that matrix, instead you learn um, an adjustment to those weights that's parameterized by um, a low rank approximation of the weight matrix. Um, so instead of taking this full like n by m matrix that has n times n, n times m parameters. Instead you take a smaller number of parameters um, and you transform them in a deterministic way uh, to be the same size as the output. Um, and so you're learning a tiny subset of parameters that are applied to the output in a deterministic way. And yeah, oh this is cool, I forgot about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, it's bas it's basically basic mathematics. Um, yeah, and and it works surprisingly well. Um, I would say the limitation with LoRa is that um, and the limitation of fine tuning on a small amount of data in general is that like mental model I have is um, like the the um. The meat of what the model can do is determined by the largest data set that it's trained on. And so like the core capabilities of the model mostly come from the initial pre-training on the whole internet. And then the additional fine tuning that is done on top of that is like a way of refining the behavior of the model, like constraining the behavior of the model from that. Um, just, this is just an intuition or like a mental model. And so the supervised fine tuning constrains the model to like follow instructions um, in, a, in a way that we would expect. And in a similar way, if you're, if you're fine tuning, especially on a very small number of examples, um, usually the model will learn how to replicate the surface level patterns in that small number of examples, not the deeper like um, uh, reasoning or harder to capture things as part of that. Um, and so there's a paper from Berkeley maybe six months ago that showed that um, uh, reinfor like models fine tune with reinforcement learning from human feedback perform much better on human evaluation benchmarks than models that don't have RLHF. But they actually are, um, some, in some cases, less factually accurate than the models that humans rate less highly. Um, and so the phenomenon that's occurring is that like, uh, RLHF makes models sound more convincing, um, but it doesn't actually make them more correct. Uh, but it turns out that most of the time when people are doing evaluations, that's what they care about, is uh, how convincing the models sound. Um, so that's the thing to be careful about with fine tuning is that like if you are fine tuning on a small amount of data, you can, you can get surface level things like structure, patterns, things like that pretty easily, um, but you're not gonna probably teach the model new capabilities um, unless you have a massive amount of data. So reinforcement learning from human feedback, um, again, it's a more complicated way to do fine tuning. Um, the way this works is you collect demonstration data, um, then that demonstration data um, is, uh, well, I think the critical part starts at step two here. So you collect comparison data, where humans say, I prefer output A or I prefer output B. Like this answer is better to me than this answer. 
Um, and then what you use that data to do is not to train the model directly, but to train an auxiliary model that's used to predict human preferences. Um, that auxiliary model can be used to predict human preferences on data um, that was not seen by the model um, when that, well, that was not seen when that auxiliary model was trained. Um, and so you use that model as a signal um, to train the base model using um, the class of, like, set of techniques called reinforcement learning. Um, and so the reason why RLHF is so difficult to do and why so few companies do it is because one, it's just a lot more complicated to train two models. And two, because reinforcement learning in general is like incredibly finicky. Um, and it's difficult, as difficult it is, as it is to train models and do that reliably, um, with supervised learning, it's like much harder to do it with RL. Um, so recommendations on fine tuning. Um, you probably don't need to do fine tuning, honestly. Um, at least not right now, like at least not in the initial phases of your project. Uh, I think people reach for this too soon in their projects because I don't know why. I guess it sounds more cool or interesting or you feel like you're doing something that's more technically sound or, um, or where you're building more of a core technical advantage. Um, but I think the reality is that like most people don't put enough effort into their baseline, which is prompt engineering, chaining, and information retrieval. Um, those things are way easier to do. They're way more reliable and they're gonna be way cheaper for your company. Um, good reasons to fine tune. I think one of the best ones is cost reduction. So if you do have a cost issue, you can often mimic GPT-4 performance with a much smaller and cheaper model. But um, again, cost op optimization is an optimization. So don't do this until you can solve the task. Uh, speed improvement, similar thing. Um, and then I think like kind of non-optimization use cases would be like if you're having trouble getting consistent structure to the output of your model, um, or if you have a ton of data and there's just nothing you can do that will make the retrieval system work. Um, those, are, those are good use cases for fine tuning as well. Uh, LoRa like, and parameter efficient fine tuning is what I'd reach for first. It's, uh, it's cheaper, it's more reliable, it's more accessible, um, but it is ultimately also a little bit limited. Um, and then I, I probably wouldn't touch RLHF today um, unless you are like a big company that's gonna be putting a lot of effort into, into trying to make this work. So I guess conclusion, I wanna just kind of wrap up this section by talking about like how to pull all these pieces together into um, hopefully a more sane process for building LLM powered applications. Um, a process that mimics test driven development in software engineering. So we start with the core workflow around prompt or chain development. Um, we start with the base LLM. We choose that LLM, we start with GPT-4 and then maybe we, we uh, adjust it later. Then we develop a prompt or a chain we test that prompter chain on our current evaluation data set. And then once it, we're like happy with how it performs on that, that evaluation or those set of tests, then we deploy it. Um, and once we deploy it, we start to collect feedback from our end users. And those end users depend on what stage we are in in the project. When I start on a project, I am the end user. Like I'm the one I'm collecting feedback from. And then I'll move on and I'll collect that feedback from my friends or my close colleagues who I'm working on this project with. Um, then maybe I'll roll it out more broadly in our organization. Um, then I'll start to roll it out to alpha users, beta users. And at each of those phases, you'll do the same process of collecting user feedback. Um, that fee user feedback results in interaction data. Like, what did the users, what was the result of the users using this application? What did they give us? What feedback did they give us? Um, and we capture that interaction data and start to categorize it into themes. Um, those themes, are turned into additional test data um, that we can use to build a richer and richer test set that captures more and more of the behaviors of how we want this system to perform in the real world. Um, and it also is captured as an improvement to our prompt or our chain. Um, and then finally, like once I've you know, um, exhausted the utility I can get by just making improvements to my prompt or my chain or my retrieval system, then um, I can run a similar kind of outer loop to this workflow that involves fine tuning, where I take the same interaction data I'm getting from my end users and I turn that not into test data but actually into training data, um, which I can use to fine tune the model and eventually update the base LLM. And then this process repeats um, at the different phases of the workflow, um, starting with yourself or your development team as the users, um, then rolling out to um, the rest of your team as users, and then finally with your customers in the loop as users as well. So I think if you apply all the lessons from this um, discussion, then we can hopefully move from something that feels like kind of very hacky and, and uh, 
ad hoc to something that starts to feel like more of a systematic um, process um, that is grounded in, in, uh, in like measurement and data collection. 